Can you explain why you decided to look for a middle way between secular humanism and full-blown theism? Well, I grew up in a liberal Protestant family, uh, so I never had the great struggle against my upbringing that many people have. Um, I started off into graduate school working on a degree in theology. Uh, I was quite interested in philosophy, but the theological questions seemed more interesting than the analytic philosophy that I saw in graduate school. Uh, but gradually, as time went on, uh, my belief in God got more and more attenuated. And uh, finally I broke. Uh, I finally I broke with the notion. But I felt that there was something lacking, something missing. And I would put it in a couple of ways. Uh, one, I had a real deep sense that the 8th century Hebrew prophets like Amos, Hosea, and Isaiah were really uh, working on the social evils in society. Uh, as Amos said, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And I thought that sometimes that could be missing in humanism. Uh, in a secular society, although not so much in religious humanism. But the other thing I felt was lacking, when I was 16, believe it or not, I had a conversion experience. And one of the things that I got from that experience was a sense that there is a grace to life, that there are gifts to life, that the meaningfulness of life is not just something that you struggle for and earn, but also something that's given to you. And I felt that some of that was missing in a full-blown secularism. So what I looked for and tried to find was some way of recovering some religious values within a secular outlook. Uh, would you tell um or talk about your triadic model of minimalist transcendence? Well, one of the things that I thought I would do would be to use a secular analog to the concept of God as a sort of a grid to use to analyze our secular human experience. And what I did was to discover what I call the triadic experience of transcendence. I remember I'm looking now for non theistic, a non theistic outlook, but something where there is an analog to the traditional experience of God, at least the experience of God in monotheism. Um, take the uh, beginning of the Ten Commandments in the 20th chapter of Exodus. starts off, For I am the Lord thy God who brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. It starts with a gracious a reference to a gracious act of God, the liberation of the children of Israel from Egypt. And only after recalling this gracious act is there a description of, or there is the imperatives of what should be done and what should not be done. Uh, in traditional Christian terminology, this is sometimes called grace and law. And it seemed to me that both these, the gracious act of God and law, are involved in the traditional Christian, Jewish, and Muslim understanding. 
Now, what is there within our secular experience? Well, let me go back first and let's kind of read, describe this triangle some more. The base of the triangle, the two corners of the triangle, are the graciousness of God and the demand of God. Grace and challenge, blessing, resource, and the imperative, judgment. Uh, Irenaeus sometimes referred to these as the two hands of God. Uh, the apex is that there is something transcendent to our ordinary experience of grace and our ordinary experience of challenge or moral demand. Now, what I look for in our non-religious secular life was to see if I could find anything somewhat analogous to that. And the trick in my thinking was to find a this-worldly transcendence. Um, for example, my father died when I was uh, around 30, and I remember sitting in the living room the day he died, and my daughter, who was about eight years old, coming in, seeing that there was something wrong, I said, Dad, what's the matter? And I said, my father died. And she said, oh, Dad, and came up to me and put her arm around me. Now, uh, that was clearly a gift of grace from her to me. And I also call it a sense of minimalist grace or minimalist transcendence because given the situation where I was, her gift to me came from outside of the situation in which I was. And so her gracious act was transcendent to where I was at the time. You could call this horizontal transcendence instead of vertical transcendence, but it transcended the situation where I was at the time. Now, another example. Uh, during the late 60s, there was a, it was perfectly legal in the city of Evanston, where I was living, to discriminate in selling and renting housing to Jews and blacks. Uh, in fact, the Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court had said that this was perfectly legal. It was in the Deerfield case. And in the city of Evanston, the black community, together with some of the liberal white community, got together to start some open housing marches. One night a week, marching through downtown Evanston to put pressure on the city council to pass an open housing ordinance. And when my wife and I found out about it, we said we should go on these marches. We were busy. I was a graduate student uh, trying to raise a family and teaching full time, very busy. But we felt that this was the right opportunity. We felt that this was a wonderful opportunity to educate our kids about uh, human rights and the struggle for human rights in America. And that we felt pulled out of the situation in which we were by this moral demand. So, while the action that my daughter took was a gracious act, the call to take part in the open housing marches was a 
call a, uh, a, a demand. Both of these had a transcendent element in the sense that they pulled me and in the latter case my family out of the situation in which we were. So I call that situational transcendence or relative transcendence. Uh, and this is a secular analog of the religious monotheist experience of grace and law. And I like to talk about my experiences because they're experiences that you have not had. Your experiences are different from mine. But in describing my experience, perhaps I can elicit from you a sense and understanding of some of the events in your life. And so, uh, I noted that in the religions of the world, there was this triad, what Rudolf Otto and the idea of the holy called the sense of the numinous, uh, tremendum and fascinans, or Luther, uh, law and grace, or grace and law. And uh, what I did was to try to explore our secular experience not only the experience of the individual, as I described uh, his experiences, but also um, experiences like the struggle for truth in science. Uh, science is a truth, is a quest for truth. And this quest has an element of transcendence but it is a secular experience and it is also a relative experience in the sense that it does not pull us towards, it does not give us the absolute truth, but it is a yearning towards the more and more closer approximation to the truth of the world. And I also think that the search for justice is similarly uh, a search for the transcendence or the lure, the pull of transcendence. I think the search for beauty is a sense of relative transcendence. Uh, we will never achieve perfect beauty, but the attempt to create the attempt to appreciate beauty, not only in the fine arts such as music, dance, poetry, painting, but also on just getting up in the morning and trying to get yourself together is an attempt to move towards where we are, towards something, uh, a further realization of beauty. So, I know Bill Murray has, William Murray has said in his book, Reason and Reverence, that uh, he appreciates my attempt to rethink the notion of God, although he has trouble with it. And I'm not sure I'm really trying to rethink the notion as that I'm trying to uh, get along without it and yet, at the same time, uh, being able to communicate and talk with the folks who do. Uh, an interesting question that you've asked me, Miriam, is what is it like to live a religious life with a minimalist understanding of transcendence? Well, in one sense, it's not that much different from what anyone else is trying to do, who's trying to live a good life. Uh, it's very important to me that it's not only an attempt to lead a good life, 
but also an attempt to be open to the healing resources, the resources of transcendence, the unexpected hugs, the gifts of consecrated water. Um, more recently I've been trying to ask myself what is the term religion? What is religion? As we say sometimes, I'm not religious but I am spiritual. And uh, I want to rehabilitate the term religion to be able to use it in talking about religious humanism or religious naturalism or as Bill Murray says, uh, humanist religious naturalism. I think that's the term he uses. And there are a zillion definitions of the word religion, uh, including going back to the etymology, it's the religio, what ties us together. And I'll offer yet another definition of religion, why not? Uh, to me, religion is our attempt to live our lives in relation to the big picture. Religion is our attempt to make sense of this world in terms of the big picture and to live our life in terms of the big picture. The biggest picture that we can grasp of the world, which means very definitely the scientific picture, but it's more than just the scientific picture because we live not just in terms of scientific facts, but in terms of our insight, or what I sometimes call our surmises, our guesses as to what life is about. And these guesses, these insights should be informed by the best that science has given us, but they're not, strictly speaking, just scientific theories or scientific hypotheses. Uh, part of the question we're raising is what is the relation between religion and ethics? And I think that one of the things that my religious naturalism, my humanistic religious naturalism gives me is a motivation to struggle for truth and justice and beauty. Uh, when you're surrounded with a bunch of chickens, it's hard to soar like an eagle. And when we look at uh, the really stupid things that our leaders do, uh, sometimes it's really easy to say, oh, what's the use? Why should I bother uh, when these things are happening? And to me, my religious orientation helps provide motivation for the struggle. And there's another thing. One thing I know about you is, as well as myself, is that you and I uh, struggle with moral failure. We don't live up to our own self-ideals. And we need a, we need a sense of the, the forgiving, the forgiving words in this world, the gifts which enable us to get back on our feet, and sometimes classical humanism has forgotten these, uh, 
the gifts of religion or spirituality in helping us deal with our failures. And I think another thing that my religious naturalism does for me uh, is that it gives a specific flavor or a specific point to my ethical struggles. Namely, that we should not only try to work towards human flourishing, but for the flourishing of the entire planet. Or as the Buddhists say, may all beings flourish. Uh, now, in one sense, this is no different, but from what uh, any environmental activist would do, but it's um, since the gifts and the challenges of life come from the entire universe, we need to be looking for the flourishing of we need of uh, all of life. Indeed, we need to nurture and protect our planet Earth, our home. Is that what the word naturalism does for you, rather than humanism? Humanism having a clear focus on the human, but nature opens up all the natural resources and places us within that yes. wider system? Yes. Uh, I, when I became a Unitarian, studied its history, this was about 12 years ago, I identified with the humanist strand in our tradition, but at the same time I was critical of it. I have been critical, namely that it can be anthropocentric, and by using the term naturalism, it's a way of reminding us that we have a larger context. <laughs>